Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Conference on World Affairs. It's really exciting to start the week here. I'm glad so many of you came to the uh, panel on water policy. So I need to start with this for taping purposes. Today is Monday, April 9th, 2018, 9.30 a.m., and this is panel 1004, Water Policy, Not As Dry As You Think. I'm going to start by introducing myself a little bit and the panelists. Um, and explain the program to you. So we have 75 minutes with these great panelists. Uh, most of them have been here before, but not everyone. So um, welcome to the Conference on World Affairs. Thanks to our speakers. Um, we'll start with opening remarks from each of the panelists of about seven minutes. I know it doesn't sound like long, but we like to give plenty of time for them to interact with one another and then for questions and answers. Uh, we'll have about 15 minutes after they do their presentations for them to interact to each other's comments. And then we'll open it up to questions and answers. <coughs> uh, for Q&A, uh, like last year, if you were here, we're asking you to use your app if you've um, loaded that up already to ask questions. And if you've done that, you've received directions. You just go on the app for CWA and put in the panel number. I don't know if it's on here. It's 1004 any time during the talk um, to give me your questions. Throughout the conference, students have preference for seating and for your Q&A. So if you're a student, first thing, you know, type up the very top students so I can be alerted um, of who you are. So, uh, and you'll get first preference for your questions. Um, let's see. That's if the system works. If you don't, don't have an app, uh, you can raise your hand and we have, um, Producers, you'll see them on the side and back here with uh, index cards. And just raise your hand and they'll give you a card and write down your question. And again, please indicate if you're a student. Okay, so let's get moving on the topic today. My name is Rita Cleese. I'm an environmental engineer on the faculty here at CU in engineering. My career has been in the water sector, so this is a topic near and dear to my heart that I don't think is dry. Don't know who wrote that title. Um, <laughs> And I'm sure you'll, you won't feel that way either after you hear our panelists. Before joining the environmental uh, engineering faculty a few years ago, my career has been in international development in the water sector. I'm retired from the World Bank where I did projects on water resource management, uh, issues, work with issues of uh, water and conflict, and particularly focused on uh, drinking water provision for underserved populations in developing countries. Uh, it's widely recognized that the uh, world is experiencing a global water crisis. That's what our panelists will be addressing today from a number of different perspectives. And hopefully we'll get to the issue of talking about what water policy responses can be as well. You can read the speaker bios in your program, so I'm not going to repeat much of that. Uh, what I did pull out from their bios um, are issues pertinent to the topic today. All of our speakers are speaking on at least half a dozen panels on different issues. So their bios are broad. But let me tell you about their backgrounds in water. Um, first, we have Alexander Verbeek. Am I saying that right? Yes. Yes, great. Okay. For the first, Pat, who's a newcomer to CWA and Colorado, uh, for the past 25 years, Alexander's been working on international issues at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the Netherlands. He focuses on climate change, uh, the water food energy nexus. He now works as an independent consultant on a wide range of proje projects and initiatives as a diplomat and policy advisor. Uh, okay. He'll be talking to us about uh, international water policy and climate smart water policies. And you can find out more about Alexander by looking at his great, great Twitter site where he combines, it looks like, his love of photography with his interest in, uh, in water and global water issues. On my left is Martha Gose. When I looked her up online, she was described as, quote, she's one of those behind the scenes people who actually run the world. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll find out about that. Uh, as a business person in the public and private spheres, her work includes leadership in the U.S. water uh, service delivery sector. She can talk to us about U.S. national water policy, the state of water infrastructure, public-private partnerships. 
uh, American Water Works, where she works, is the largest publicly traded U.S. water and wastewater utility company. And Martha will be on uh, several panels, I noticed, during the week on women in leadership. Dr. Susan Shaw, next to Alexander, reminds us that clean water doesn't happen without environmental leadership. She's an outstanding and internationally recognized uh, scientist and ocean conservationist. Uh, and a well-known figure in the fight against ocean pollution. She's an environmental health scientist, explorer, ocean conservationist. And she brings to the panel first-hand experience on remedial policies as they relate to water pollution. And finally, Dr. Heather Lazarus is uh, one of us from Boulder, Colorado, where she works at NCAR, the National Center for Atmospheric Research. She's a project scientist in the meso and micro scale meteorology lab at NCAR. Part of her research is on weather and climate risks, and she studied the human dimensions of water-related events such as floods and droughts. Okay, so we're ready to get started. Each of our panelists will talk for about six or seven minutes. I'll give you a little warning. And Alexander's going to start. I asked each of the panelists to give me a little tidbit of info that you can't pick up in their bio. Alexander mentioned, um, where's my little note on you, Alexander, okay. Um, he writes books about islands, and then as a water, uh, pardon me, landlocked state, that's not much that we hear about in Colorado, so we look forward to your comments, Alexander. Thank you, Rita. Islands is the last thing I was planning to talk about, but they might come up. Surrounded by water, not a dry subject. Um, I just arrived from the Netherlands. I arrived here on Saturday, and anybody of you who's been there or who's seen images of the Netherlands probably thinking about, you know, I see some hands going up. Great that you've been there. And uh, you think about the images of, you know, it's, it's, it's green, it's very flat, uh, there's a lot of water everywhere. Um, normally, I've, I've done a lot of sailing. I'm a sailing instructor. Normally, you, when, when you sail in the Netherlands, you sail higher than the land actually is. The land is below sea level. We're constantly pumping out the water to keep our feet dry. Some people say that's why we're the tallest people in the world. It's a kind of <laughs> evolu evolutionary uh, um, uh, selection process that took place. Um, I'm an average sized Dutchman at 190. I don't know what that's in feet. Um, uh, so what, uh, what we've learned to do in the Netherlands is to fight against the water. Keep pumping out the water. That's why you have those beautiful windmills. That's why you get so many tourists. And they're actually still working. Of course, we use a lot of more modern techniques nowadays. But what is changing in the Netherlands is that for after thousands of years of fighting against the water, we started to realize some 20 years ago when we had huge floodings of not on the seaside, but by the rivers. We were we're this kind of gutter of Europe where all the big rivers are ending, we're a big delta, and those rivers were overflowing, and we realized that we had overdone it a bit. We were so good in building dikes that we had taken more and more space off the river. We couldn't manage it anymore. So a development that you see is that we are, instead of building against nature, we're now building with nature. And that's a very different uh, way of, of dealing with water. So, for instance, what we do, we need we need our dunes on the coastline to, to keep the sea out. And instead of what we used to do in the past, sometimes artificially make dunes by, by throwing sand on it, we do it now differently. We just made a huge pile of sand in one area close to Rotterdam in front of the coastline that we pumped up. And that's all. We just leave it there. And then we wait for nature, the forces of nature, to spread the sand along the coast making the beaches wider in the next 20 years or so. And because they are wider, more sand will be blown on the dunes. And that's how we build with nature. And there are many of those kind of examples. And in the few minutes that I've been given, I cannot mention them. But we make like artificial dunes and put houses on top. It's fun. You live on a dune, but you can also filter the water. So there's a lot of advantages there. Um, if we move to a global scale, just want to give a bit of perspective from a few kinds of ways to show that water is not a dry subject. Um, you see that the amount of water that we have on the planet is exactly the same, the amount of fresh water, as we had like 10,000 years ago. 
it's not changing. Demand is increasing, the amount of people are increasing, our consumption is increasing. The amount of water is the same, and the amount of clean water is actually getting a bit less. If you would pull, put all the water in the world, all the fresh water that we have in the rivers and the lakes, you would put it in a big balloon, you would you pump all that water in. That balloon would only be 55 kilometers across, that's like 35 miles. That's all the fresh water in the world. That's what we're talking about today. We might talk about oceans, that's, that's a different part, but all the fresh water, that's all we have. Every year, the World Economic Forum in January produces the World Risk Report. They ask the, the most important CEOs in the world and the best think tanks in the world, what are for the next 10 years the most likely risks and the risks that will have the most impact and the ones that have both that, they're likely and have a huge impact, are the most important ones to focus on for the next 10 years. And if you look at it 10 years ago, it was like terrorism, weapons of mass destruction, Iraq, Iran, those kind of uh, issues were mentioned. And if you look nowadays, in the past five years or so, water, climate change, um, the, the fact that we are to, to do too little mitigation, that we do too little on adaptation, uh, those kind of water and climate related issues are in the top right corner in this graph. So the world starts to recognize how huge the risks are related to water. If you think, for instance, on the amount of people that don't have daily access to water, that is about 800 million people in the world don't have daily access to water. But to show uh, the increase in 10 years' time from now, that's amount of people that don't have daily access to water is nearly doubled. So the problem is increasing and it's related to, to climate change, to consumption growth, it's related to governance, it's related to international cooperation, a lot of aspects I'm sure uh, we will talk about today. Um, another aspect of water, in the water community we talk about wash, the, the water and sanitation and, and hygiene. Uh, that's related to these um, uh, 1.4 billion people that in less than 10 years' time won't have access uh, to water. Um, that is um, very much related to, to health care. Um, it is related to decent decency and dignity um, that you have access to a toilet. We live in a strange world where more people have access to a mobile phone than that they have access to a clean toilet. It has to do with safety of women. Um, it reduces uh, sexual harassment and, 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 and violence if you provide more facilities. It has to do with education. In many cultures, girls, uh, when they reach their puberty and they're getting their first periods, they can't go to school because there's no toilet. Imagine the impact that that will have, that you have cultures where girls at, at a very early age are taken off school for that reason. That also means that they will much earlier get children and they will get more children in their lives. On average, they will get like five children. If you give a girl education um, until the end of high school, she will on average have only two children, which for many, many reasons is much better for the whole planet and better for her, and she will have much better economic chances and, and, and much more impact. So that's another aspect of water. I see I'm reaching uh, the seven minutes, so um, I'll stop my clock and I'll stop talking. There's a lot more that I wanted to say, but we'll get to that later. Okay, thank, thank you, you, Alexander. Uh, next we'll hear from uh, Susan Shaw. Um, interesting addition to her bio. Susan was the 19th gold medalist and won that from the Society of Women Geographers, which includes luminaries like Jane Goodall. Susan? Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, it's interesting that the Society for Women Geographers, I was telling uh, earlier, is uh, the reason women were called geographers was because um, they traveled. And so the women that were outstanding, like uh, Amelia Earhart was the first gold medalist for the society. It's a very old society, started in the 30s. And at that time, women were not permitted to be uh, explorers. They were not allowed in the uh, Explorers Club. I happen to be a member of the Explorers Club. They started bringing women in 1981. So yay, <laughs> yay for us, you know. But um, 
that it's a very, uh, the, the Society of Women Geographers is a very, very respectable, wonderful uh, organization. Um, I, um, uh, I ha I'm a marine toxicologist, environmental health scientist, and I founded a marine t uh, pollution uh, institute on the main coast about uh, 1990. And uh, we've been tracking ocean pollution for about, you know, 25 years now. And we're looking at petroleum products, petrochemicals like PCBs, industrial chemicals, agricultural chemicals, DDT, and then moving toward the more uh, the chemicals that come from indoor environments like the flame retardants that are added to plastics, plastics themselves, plasticizers, all these chemicals that are, go from land to sea and have been building up in the oceans all this time. So before I talk about that, the oceans are in crisis. It's, it's uh, globally recognized. And, um, and oil is also part of the story. But um, we uh, have been looking now at uh, plastics as a huge topic here. And uh, you know, there's eight billion pieces of uh, plastic that goes into the ocean annually. It's, it's staggering. We're starting to find plastic bits where you should find sand on beaches. Um, you, you know, we're just clogging our oceans with plastic. So uh, I was, we've been studying this along the main coast and we developed ways of analyzing what are called microplastics, the breakdown, the tiny fragments you cannot see in the water, but they are plastic fragments. They're less than five millimeters. And uh, we were asked to come uh, work with a group here, the Inland Ocean Coalition, as a matter of fact, uh, which sounds very, uh, so the ocean is, has come to Colorado and is, uh, you know, well, very well. Um, and we did a study of the streams and rivers flowing into Denver and Boulder. It wasn't a large study, it was a pilot study that we're going to build on, but we actually found uh, quite a bit, substantial amounts of microplastics in those waters. And uh, so this is something that it's affecting water in general. Our use of uh, petrochemicals, our use of plastics, and plastics are petroleum-based. It's a, a petrochemical. So I want to backtrack just for a second and talk about the ocean crisis that's been mounting for the past few years. Since World War II, our use, primarily our use of petrochemicals has just ballooned and, um, and plastics to such an, uh, an extent that we've actually altered ocean chemistry. And um, I am counting in that equation the release of uh, uh, toxic gases, the uh, carbon dioxide and other gases that are uh, kind of are now making the atmosphere acid and, and changing the chemistry of the whole of the world that we live in. Um, <clears throat> so um, when we talk about the ocean crisis, we talk about pollution combined with climate change. All these things are related to pollution. They are man-made problems, in in my opinion, that's scientific consensus, and also over exploitation, what we're taking out of the ocean. So. Yeah, the chemicals don't just stay, you know, on land. When we use industrial chemicals, uh, pesticides, these these chemicals are very, very persistent. They do not break down in nature. Um, animals can't metabolize them, so they build up in food webs. They move from surface waters to ocean waters. Eventually, the oceans are the final sink. The final reservoir for all of our petrochemicals are the oceans. That's why. We find extremely high levels of these, every kind of chemical you can think of in organic chemicals in the bodies of fish, marine mammals. And marine mammals have a particularly high level of like a thousand times higher than uh, animals on Earth or humans because of, and we're talking PCBs, DDT, chemicals that were banned 40 years ago, they're still there. They're in very high levels in tissue of animals, uh, ocean animals. So um, it, the concern now has shifted to indoor chemicals that we're using um, that, um, like in foam uh, furniture, the chairs you're sitting on, on 
flame retardants are added to those, uh, to that foam, to plastics, what's added to plastics to make it soft or hard. You know, um, the, the chemicals that are like Teflon that we use um, for um, stain resistance, uh, water resist, waterproofing, even in uh, textiles and camping gear, we, we use chemicals, and these chemicals have been studied for long enough now to know how toxic they are. So uh, 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 climate change, the warming that's happening at a very rapid pace is compounding the issue. And now that the, the ice at the poles is mes melting, uh, there's a, it's increasing the release of chemicals that were, say, left behind from a, a military base that we thought we've buried in the ice, would be buried in ice for millennia, <coughs> and this is not the case. Um, so we, we're, we're watching the, the uh, in my opinion, from, you know, being in the field I'm in, it's a very big crisis and we're watching uh, kind of a breakdown of our uh, ocean system. That's the end of the line because um, that the oceans are uh, what support our planet. We are an ocean planet. Um, the International uh, Union for Conservation of Nature uh, is now predicting that we ha will have 40% uh, of all marine mammals, 40% are facing extinction within 10 to 15 years. Um, this is 5,500 uh, mammalian species on Earth today, 127 are marine, and of those, 127, we're losing 40%. And this, we're talking not just the ice, uh, 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 bound animals, the polar bears, the, the seals that rely on the ice. We're talking uh, whales, dolphins, you know, all over the place. So this is a very big problem. Um, I, like other uh, scientists in my field, have started uh, be becoming active in policy. And, and uh, like very frequently I give testimony, work with uh, legislators to uh, restrict uh, toxic chemicals when we have enough evidence that they are really, uh, really harmful. And, uh, you know, it's just an, we are really up against it. We have an ongoing battle on our hands. And uh, when I went into this field, I was a happy scientist. I thought, this is going to be a lot of fun. And, you know, I, I'm a scientist. I like uh, look, diving into something, figuring it out, solving problems. And I was having a great time. In She's like, things fell apart. So uh, uh, anyway, um, we're now from our from our uh, institute in Maine. We're working all over the world, working with Sweden, Iceland, Greenland, on a big project, looking at pollution and climate change impacts on nine different species of whales, dolphins, seals, and porpoise that are uh, migrating all over the northern hemisphere. We're also working, as I mentioned, here in Colorado with. Uh, to look at what's going on with this, the surface waters here, and all these uh, all these um, problems are interrelated. So um, I am one minute. Oh, a whole minute. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to say that um, uh, plastics has really gotten world attention, and and it, it's a toxic material. It's petrochemical base. One of the reasons for this is it, there's a plus side to this is that it, plastics, you can see it. It's a poster child for, uh, you know, chemical pollution, which you cannot see. So people understand plastics as something harmful. They understand when they walk on the beach and they see plastic trash or they see, you know, plastic beads and instead of sand. We understand that. We, we are horrified by it. So it's galvanized world opinion to on the oceans, and I, I think there's a hopeful sign here with some of the things that have to happen uh, globally. We have to have, uh, you know, policies, cooperation that we have not ever had before, and you can see some of that starting to evolve, and um, Alexander was mentioning some of that. So I hope we have a chance to talk about that because um, the solutions are absolutely, you know, we. We can't go further. We're already facing mass extinctions. So, and, and this is, uh, you know, 
easily predicted. So um, it's a time for solutions. It's time for let's, let's you know, come together. And that's why I, I'm here. That's exactly why I'm here in Colorado today. So thank you very much. Thank you, Susan. Okay, well, from Alexander and Susan, we've taken a look at the global water crisis and some particular threats to our water resources. Now we're going to turn to Martha Clark Goes. You can have clean drinking water, but if you don't get it in a, uh, in a safe and equitable way to the people who need it, uh, it doesn't do you much good. So Martha can talk to us a bit about uh, American Water Works and um, sustainable service delivery of drinking water. And a little tidbit about Martha. Despite the fact she's going to be on panels about women in leadership, she was honored as an independent man along with Margaret Thatcher several years ago. So I guess <laughs> she can be on other panels as well. Thank you. Um, as as uh, Rita was saying, I'm, I'm really more the domestic and corporate view of the world of water at this point. Um, I serve on the board of American Water and have been on their board for approximately 14 years. So I've seen a big change in the industry and a big change in the interest in the industry. Um, I will give you a couple fun facts to frame the discussion. Uh, and some of you may have been here last year, so you've heard some of these before, but they haven't changed much, as you can imagine. Um, the actual um, useful life of most pipes at, from a technical or accounting perspective is anywhere from 50 to 75 years. These are the pipes underground that you don't see, so you don't know how bad they are. Um, the average life actual life of the pipes underground in the United States, and this is more preponderantly, uh, preponderance more in the east part of the United States because it's the older part, but even in parts of the west, the average age of the uh, water plant in this country is 250 years. And again, average useful, useful life is 50 to 75. As a result of that, um, when we have something called produced water, which is the water that we've processed and we've, you know, chemically treated so that it's clean and it meets all the drinking water standards and the EPA standards. When we put that through the pipe, and I say we collectively, because American Water, frankly, has done a fair amount of investment the last few years, so our averages are lower. I'll give you those in a minute. But the average amount of the produced water that goes through the, that system uh, approximately 25 to 28 percent of it is lost to leakage. I don't know any other industry that would put up with 25, losing 25 percent of finished product before it got to the customer. But that's what we're dealing with. And people don't know that because they don't see it. We don't talk about it enough. Um, our averages at American Water, our average plant is only 180 years old. And our leakage is approximately 19 percent. So that's because we spend anywhere from a billion to a billion five a year. Our company spends a billion to a billion five a year on investment in our properties. Uh, that dwarfs anybody <laughs> because we are the largest, pu largest publicly traded company. But uh, what I, one of the things, and again, what I was told this was about policy, one of the things I asked American Water to pro you know, provide me with some background on what it is we're lobbying at both the national and the um, state and local level in terms of policy factors. And a lot of it has to do with the fact, not surprising, of lack of, of uh, investment in infrastructure generally. As you well know, <laughs> that's a big topic across the board. And water tends to be at the low end of that investment uh, spectrum. So we've, we've proposed several things, again, that we're working both at the federal level and then we're working with uh, state and local to try to change laws at the state, state and local level, at least in the, the communities where we provide water, to do a number of things to encourage both investment and providing funding for investment. Um, one of the other issues in the water business, another fun fact, is that approximately 84% of the water uh, providers, or 84 percent of the purveyors of water, the utilities, are serving something like 10,000 or less people. So if you think about that, what is, how fractured this industry is. And it also means that most of these people, even some of the large mu uh, municipal utilities, but certainly a lot of these smaller water companies, don't have access to capital. They don't have the capital resources. 
So one of the things that we've been encouraging is getting some of the smaller companies to either sell and the smaller regional utilities to sell to people like ourselves, and there are the people in the private water business, or if they don't want to sell because people are very propriety, propriety about their uh, water, they don't want to sell their water. Interestingly enough, they'll sell their wastewater, but they won't sell their water. Um, so it's easier to buy a wastewater utility. But you know, one of the things that we've tried to encourage if they don't want to sell is to at least hire us as an operator because we have a professional staff. We understand how to manage water utilities. Um, there's a notable example that I'm sure all of you know in Michigan that was, was not managed by a professional staff, although they did, I'll give them credit, they did bring in an outside consultant to uh, consult with them about what they should do. You may know the background, but the Flint took over their water production from uh, Detroit when they went bankrupt. They did not have a professional staff. I think they might have had one person, and I don't even know how long he'd been in the job. And what often happens, and I'm not saying it's the case in Flint, but what often happens is these are political patronage jobs. And so people are put in the job that know nothing about the business. Mm -hmm. So they did hire a, um, a consultant. My understanding of the situation was that they were, um, it was recommended that they put a certain chemical in the water that's an anti-corrosive. Uh, that would prevent the pipes from corroding. They decided not to. It would have been something around, I, I want to say, a hundredth of a cent per gallon, but they didn't want to spend the money. And you know what the result was. And this could happen elsewhere because, uh, again, the lack of professionalism, the lack of understanding standards, et cetera. So, again, if people don't want to sell their municipal utilities or their small utilities, the very least they could do is hire professional management. And we do a lot of O&M, operations and maintenance contracts, for a lot of smaller utilities. But uh, so we feel the first, the first line of defense is to get professional management into these utilities because at the end of the day, uh, we all suffer as a result of this. Um, there are other things that we have also suggested. There are things related to financing of uh, infrastructure. And this isn't building new infrastructure by and large. This is just fixing that 250 year um, you know, depreciation or, or uh, useful life. So that it really is something that we need to focus on to get funding, not just to, to improve or expand, but just to, to make sure we're at the basic standard. Um, the other comment I will make, uh, just, so, just another kind of fun fact, um, bottled water. Bottled water, uh, first of all, is, is more expensive than utility water. It's um, more pollutive in the sense that you have bottles that have to be recycled. And what probably most people don't know, bottled water is not uh, set or not uh, held to the same standard for safety and cleanliness as utility water. So when you're drinking bottled water, you're probably drinking something that isn't as good as your basic water that comes out of the tap. Um, just, just put that in your, your cap and think about it. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I drink bottled water too, but I've, I've become very sensitive to the whole issue because it, it isn't mm -hmm. as good water as you get out of your, your local utility, assuming you, your local utility is managed correctly. Mm -hmm. So um, I will stop there. I'm sure we'll have lots of conversations about this, but. I really, I, I'm here to encourage people in their local communities to think about um, your, you know, whether it's a, a private utility or whether it's a public utility or a municipal utility to um, pr push for more financing and pr providing the financing for this infrastructure. I mean, I, I'm involved with several uh, engineering consulting firms and and I'm just as worried about our bridges and tunnels and airports. And I live in the New York area, and you know there are a lot of issues around the tunnel in and out of New York from New Jersey to New York, and having been destroyed by Hurricane Sandy. So I'm, I'm a big proponent of all of this infrastructure. But I think that one of the ones that people are the least aware of is how poorly maintained our water facilities are in this country. And I'll give you one good example, however. I recently had the opportunity to um, tour the Las Vegas Water Company. Um, they have a big challenge because their um, water comes from Lake Mead, and because of the drought, Lake Mead has uh, dropped substantially in the last several years. 
And in fact, the Las Vegas Water Company, which is a municipal utility, has had to build inlets further down in the Lake Mead area in order to get their water because their inlets have, have now been exposed to the air. But um, they, they can brag about the fact that their average plant is 19 years old. So if you want to go live in a place that has a really up-to-date water system, Las Vegas is it. <laughs> Thank you, Martha. Our next speaker is Dr. Heather Lazarus, which, as I mentioned, is a, uh, she's a scientist and anthropologist. Uh, some of her current research uh, includes examining public perceptions of water and climate-related uh, disasters, including floods, hurricanes, and drought. Uh, and a fun fact about Heather, she is also interested, as, uh, as Alexander, in islands and had done her research as an anthropologist in Tuvalu in, South, in the South Pacific. Great, thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, I am local. I grew up here in the mountains, just outside of Boulder. And so, you know, islands were this super curious thing that had water all around them and, you know, like could barely imagine that growing up in the Rockies. So I found one of the smallest ones to do my dissertation work in and spent a year living there in Tuvalu in the South Pacific. And it was a really amazing experience. Um, before going to Tuvalu, my family moved to New Zealand. My father actually is an atmospheric scientist who also worked at NCAR. Um, my mother's a folklorist, so I'm an environmental anthropologist. You sort of take those two together, squish them together, and you get someone who's interested in the environment and interested in how cultures interact with that. Um, so growing up both here and in New Zealand sort of opened my eyes into different ways that people live with their environment. Um, and because I was living there, uh, Issues of the South Pacific was sort of on my radar. Um, climate change, people having to leave these small island developing states in the Pacific Islands and going to places like New Zealand and Australia. Um, and as you know, an anthropologist in graduate school, I was interested in what that looks like on the ground. What's the real experience that folks are having um, when we're seeing you know, this media interpretation of this very you know, kind of scandalous, oh my gosh, everyone has to leave event, and so that drove my dissertation work in Tuvalu, which was incredible and wonderful, um, and set me on this path to work on weather and climate risks from a different, you know, cross-cultural perspectives. So now I'm here at the National Center for Atmospheric Research um, with a handful of other social scientists. I think there's about three of us there. <laughs> so we work in a very interdisciplinary setting. Most of our colleagues are physical scientists, meteorologists, hydrologists, climate, climate scientists. Um, and with these colleagues, I, I have sort of a very strong academic background, but all of our work at NCAR, even though it's not driven by policy or directly informing policy, um, it's indirectly relevant for policy. And I think you know, we all sort of share that passion. Um, working with these in, in this interdisciplinary context has sort of set me on this road for disaster anthropology. So I have um, colleagues just back from a conference actually in Philadelphia with a bunch of my favorite anthropologists who study disasters. And among those, you know, when there's too little water or too much water. Um, and we, we understand disasters not as a physical hazard that happens to people, but as sort of the outcome of social systems, including how those are manifest in the built environment, so that disasters are socially produced. Um, and actually, Gilbert White, a geographer who was here at CU years ago, um, was sort of on that forefront of understanding that there is no such thing as a natural hazard. There are different elements of exposure, people who live closer or further away from, say, a coastline are differently exposed to hurricanes. Um, but a lot of the history of why certain populations might be exposed and why they may have barriers to, um, that makes them more sensitive to that exposure, barriers to evacuation, for example, or sheltering, those ha often have very historical um, reasons, and they're, they're permeated through a, a, a social system that um, has a lot of power inequalities, right? And so we can think about who is affected by disasters, um, and then we can think about disaster mitigation, including water policies, and how the mitigation um, policies that we come up with are sort of reflections of, they embody the values and priorities of those who have a voice in policy. Um, and so, you know, that's sort of one of the things that disaster anthropologists look, look at. Um, I'll come back to a little story maybe about water policy in Tuvalu and how um, 
sort of these ideas of you know piping water to individual households seems like a, a, a developmental milestone, right? And a lot of local folks said, no, we don't want that because the half an hour a day that it takes us, which you think would be terribly inefficient to go get water, is actually our social time. We get together, we hear what's happening with all of our community members, we connect. And so just this different sort of understanding and different worldviews and different cultures of what is efficient, what, um, what, are, what are social priorities. Um, so a couple, I just want to mention a couple sort of high level ways in which um, disaster scholars think. These are theory words, but they help us think, right? So epistemology, the way we know what we know, right? So I work with a lot of communities who have strong indigenous knowledge systems, traditional environmental knowledge, and these are passed down through generations. They're incredibly robust. They have been validated in a process different from what scientists use, peer review, right? But it's called survival and adapting, and it's worked for hundreds of years, thousands of years. Um, and the other, the other thing I wanted to mention is sort of how the world works, ontology, and that different cultures have really different ways of understanding how the world works, right? So that the ocean is not um, just our resource, it's not just a sea level rise, it's not a just a repository for plastics, but it might also be your grandmother. Um, it's your relative, right? So this sort of shift in perspective from resources to relatives um, and just opening ourselves to understand that there are a lot of um, situations in the world in which that's a very valid way uh, to be thinking about um, resources and what it means then to be sustainable, right, is honoring your family. It's not just making sure that the planet is here in seven generations. It's more nuanced than that too. Um, so just very briefly, in, in a few seconds, I also wanted to mention um, an activity that some of us at National Center for Atmospheric Research are involved in, which, bear with me, has a long name. Um, it's called Rising Voices, Collaborative Science with Indigenous Knowledge for Climate Solutions. And essentially, it's an annual workshop that um, brings people from tribal communities, the 567 federally recognized tribal communities in the US, as well as those that are not tribally recognized, as well as international communities, here to Boulder to facilitate cross-cultural um, approaches to climate uh, and weather science and policy. And we meet usually in Boulder. Um, we have about 400 engaged people who've either come to the workshops or are involved throughout the year on a really active listserv. Um, the, the website is Rising Voices. I think if you Google that plus NCAR, you'd probably find our website, which has past year's annual reports. Um, but really, it's also coming from this recognition that indigenous communities have this tremendous repository of knowledge, which we probably need now more than ever before to deal with water and other climate challenges. Um, but they're also often the voiceless in terms of policy setting. Um, and so sort of trying to address that, but from a scientific institutional perspective, right, what is the capacity NCAR could, could lend, right, is this um, sort of building robust relationships between communities and the scientists who live in communities with other scientists from this more Western um, tradition that, that NCAR is part of. So um, tomorrow, actually, we head to Duluth and we'll have our sixth annual meeting for the Rising Voices there. And then this time next year, we'll probably be back here in Boulder um, for folks who are interested. So I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Heather. Thanks to our panel for keeping their opening remarks, which is hard to do, uh, uh, concise and short, which leaves us now with about half an hour uh, for us to discuss first the panelists amongst themselves, if they have any questions, and then to open it up to questions. And we have uh, uh, several here that we can get to. Um, and I'm sorry, we don't take questions from the audience anymore in the old raise your hand, go to the microphone. So if you have a question, um, as the panelists first will chat amongst themselves for a few minutes, either uh, put it on your app or when you raise your hand, somebody will bring you a postcard. And once again, uh, index card. Make sure you identify upfront uh, big letters if you're a student so that you get your questions asked first. Um, so let me open it. Oh, got an announcement I'm supposed to make here. Uh, before we turn to your questions and answers, I'd like to quickly mention, you know, this conference is free, uh, which means it's funded through your generous community support. So if you're enjoying the event and would like to con uh, consider a small contribution, you can also find on your app a place to uh, click on the donate tab. We really appreciate that to make this possible. Um, okay, so we could spend uh, uh, maybe 10 minutes of the half an hour we have left. Um, just you all get questions around or respond to one another. Sound okay? 
Susan, do you want to say? Okay, I have a question for um, Martha, and also one for Heather, <laughs> but I'll start with Martha. Um, with uh, you brought up the, such an important uh, topic with the infrastructure and how we uh, access our drinking water and, and uh, our, our do, do a very poor job of maintaining it. But and you brought the uh, the, the example of Flint, the the lead poisoning of the water of Flint is such a it's iconic now for our country and. Um, it's gotten a lot of public attention, and I wondered if you were also um, working on uh, the perfluorinated chemicals that the, the are Teflon-like that have been contaminating. Uh, wa uh, uh, I think it's something like the water, drinking water for six million Americans, uh, and the, these chemicals are coming from um, basically it's firefighting foam. Is sprayed on aviation and military at military installations and airports. So, after so much, and even in training, they're using this very toxic substance. So, I was wondering if you um, all are working on that. Um, I'm not a scientist, so I won't be able to explain this in any great detail. But yes, um, the policy at American Water is that obviously we meet all the EPA drinking water standards and all of the chemical mm -hmm. standards that the CDC puts out. Mm -hmm. However, as you probably know, there are just hundreds of other chemicals that there are no standards for. Mm -hmm. um, we have the largest uh, of any water company in the United States, the largest research section. Um, with scientists who are working on investigating what other contaminants there are in water. And we do exceed some of the, some but not all, but we exceed a lot of the uh, requirements. And in fact, we are, um, we treat for things that aren't even required. Mm -hmm. But part of the problem is that there isn't even a list. Mm -hmm. There's not a, a, a you know, a, a, right. a uh, definitive mm -hmm. list of what all the contaminants are mm -hmm. and what the standards should be. So mm -hmm. we're trying to stay ahead of it as much as possible, but it is hard. And again, I'm not a scientist, so I can't tell you the mm -hmm. specific ones, but I know we've done a lot with the fluorocarbons and mm -hmm. some of the other chemicals. Uh, mm -hmm. And we're trying to find innovative ways to treat for these things as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Find, again, we have, um, a, a PhD scientist and several other people working for him that have various degrees in, in science and again, largest group in the country doing that. Mm -hmm. But it's a real challenge because there's just not even a standard for most of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Should I keep going? Uh, it's up to you all. Anybody else have questions? Uh, well, how will, the Alexander has one, then maybe Susan again. Well, uh, listening to all these speeches, I have a question for Basically, all three of you. Um, I think about the role of governance when, um, and that basically comes down to the question who owns the water? Water used to be something that is, you know, you can waste it like water, as people were saying. It's, 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 everybody has it. But now that it's getting more precious, and in some regions in the world much faster than in other places, but all of us will mention it. And certainly here in the U.S., in the western part of the U.S., you're also going to notice that water is becoming more precious. So then coming from Europe, where we love governance, and coming yeah. here in America, where opinions about governance are sometimes a bit different, um, I wonder where you are when I hear that there's like hundreds of all kinds of pollutants material that is in water and there's no regulation by the EPA, what do you expect, what, what would you hope that the EPA is, um, is going to do about it? When we talk about uh, plastics, um, there's all these, I mean, uh, all, all the plastics that are coming in the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of regulation would we need to stop it? Because self-regulation is clearly not enough because the ocean is getting so much plastic now that by 2050 there's more plastic in the ocean than fish. Mm -hmm. okay. There's just this whale that, that, that was beached and that died. It had more than 30 kilos of plastic in its stomach. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have the microplastics right. problem, of course. So a question for all of you. Where should, what should be the role of governance? Last remark there. As a diplomat, I have always worked from the international side of governance. So countries will have increasingly to work together on water. When you have a transboundary river, mm -hmm. 
you can, it gets more and more complicated. Who has the right to that water? Take the Nile in Egypt. Mm -hmm. If Ethiopia builds the Grand Renaissance Dam and keeps the water, then Egypt, with 80 million people in an extremely hot place, will not have enough water. And it's much worse when Sudan does actually the big problem is. Okay. I thought I was Sorry. speaking too long. Sorry. So I can <laughs> yeah. go on for yeah. a while. So issues like this. So I've worked on the, that international side. I also think this national <laughs> aspect of governance is, um, is I, I would love to hear your opinions on it. Mm -hmm. Well, all, I, I don't want to get into politics, but <laughs> I did it. we're certainly going the wrong direction. <laughs> um, this is a tough one. I mean, there, this has been an age-old issue, I, I know, outside of the United States, States, but even in the United States. I mean, Western, the Western water issue, particularly in, you know, Colorado, Arizona, California, the Colorado River. There's a wonderful book called The Cadillac Desert, if any of you are interested in the subject. It's a fabulous book. And it's a, all about how two agencies in the United States government were fighting with each other about how to regulate. So we can't even get on the same page. Mm -hmm. Um, I think this is a huge issue. Uh, I don't see great, uh, you know, optimism for finding a solution domestically, more or less on an international scale. I think it is something that's very serious, and I don't th think there's a good path to, to solving it. Because, you know, again, the example you give, it's the same kind of problem as they had in California. You know, everybody down the line wants to take their share of the water, and by the time it gets to the end, there's nothing left. Yeah. Or it's highly yeah. sal you know, salinated, or it's polluted. Uh, it's not, you know, it's not the water it was when it started at the top yeah. of the mountain. Mm -hmm. It literally doesn't reach the sea anymore. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a, an example to give. I was at the World Ocean Summit in March in Mexico, and there was a very heated discussion to this point about um, where the buck stops where, you know, and um, and as Martha said, we were, you know, we're going miserably in the wrong direction with dismantling all the regulatory, not just the regulations, but the agencies itself. And so what happened was we were talking about plastics and um, we're, we're actually in uh, terms of industry, we're, we're set, um, we're looking at what's going to be a plastics boom that we've never ever experienced before. It's predicted that there, the industry's uh, putting $164 billion into building new plants to produce more plastics with an increase predicted of 36% world production in eight years. Why? Cheap oil, shale oil. Oil is cheap. Uh, plastics are, are petroleum product. Okay, so greed sets in like crazy, right? Uh, and so on the stage were, was a man who, who from uh, Brazil who was, he's set to make billions of dollars. His company is all, you know, building uh, chemical facilities hand over fist to make more plastics, and uh, he's talking about, and, and you know, he's talking about re re recycle. No, only 10% can be recycled. Okay, collect, uh, use in other ways. Uh, so these these solutions are really um, not very clear. And um, so what happened? He he's talking about. Well, in 20 years, we'll be able to um, do something about this. We'll uh, set a goal of, of reducing by, say, 23% um, over 20, 30 year period. And then um, some, the uh, CEO of Ball Glass, who, by the way, is, lives in Boulder, he just exploded <laughs> and said, um, this is unethical, it's, uh, um, it's, not, um, it's not a moral stand, you, we, there's eight billion pieces going, plastics going into the ocean every year, you cannot tell us that you're going to keep producing for 30 years at a, at a higher rate. And, and he, the, the uh, plastics producer was saying, you're demonizing plastic. <laughs> <laughs> and so at that point, the entire audience of about a thousand people stood up 
and, so, and one after another said, this is a moral issue. The argument from the, the CEO of Ball Glass, John Hayes, was that it's corporations now have to show, take so social responsibility, and also people who are gonna profit from toxic, making toxic materials need to pay the environmental cost. And it, it speaks to, I think, what we we're all talking about, but uh, also what you brought up about um, the indigenous point of view mm -hmm. about the, who's. Can I speak to that? I, I think what's interesting, um, again, I don't want to get too much into politics, but traditionally, you know, government has oh, yeah. been the, uh, the enforcer or the, uh, the protector of the environment and uh, companies have not. And I'm not saying all companies have now become wonderful places, but what I will say is that in the investment community, there's a whole new wave. I mean, this has been an interest for a long time, but it's getting to be a very big wave, what they call ESG investing, which is environmental, social, and governance. And uh, it's partially because, quote, the millennials are more interested in these topics than our traditional, you know, uh, people in charge of investment, the investment community. And corporations are, in fact, holding themselves to higher standards. Uh, not everybody, but a lot of them are using this, as, frankly, as an opportunity to improve their investment profile for uh, the younger generation, saying, why don't you invest in our company? We're, you know, improving our, our reputation and our, our activities on the environment, on social, on the governance. Mm -hmm. um, and again, they're not perfect, but, but the fact that they are actually focusing on this, and this is a really hot topic in the investment community these days, uh, I think is, is some hope. Because the government isn't doing it right now, but the companies, many of the companies are doing it. Mm -hmm. Panelists, what I'd like to do, do now, we have about 20 minutes left, and we have a number of questions, is, um, throw out those questions for you. Um, and a number of them are from students. So if you're not a student and you submitted a question, I'll give those, uh, and many of them are identified for, for a specific panelist, to the panelists after the talk today. Um, I don't believe we have anybody coming in this room. We end at 1045, but if the panelists want to stick around and ask, answer some of your questions, um, they can. So we'll just launch into the questions. So from a student, thank you, uh, Heather. What are the first steps in supporting better management of climate-related water hazards, such as mudslides in Sierra Leone, which is a fragile country? So the question is, what, what are the steps you can take in countries uh, that are uh, deeply corrupt states or governments? What are the first steps? Yeah. Um, gosh. <laughs> I feel like if we had good answers to that question, we would have a lot fewer problems. Um, I think that, um, well, sort of, and also speaking to the last question that we just were discussing here, there's, you know, one of the reasons that policies um, sometimes don't make sense to everybody is that, you know, people have really different worldviews, right? Profit-driven, development-driven, um, more individualist versus more egalitarian, potentially grassroots, bottom-up. Um, Values and you know we can see major stalemates in policy trying to you know figure out a ro road forward when you have these different values at the table. Um, but I think when there is potential of corruption and deep power inequalities entrenched in place, I think then it becomes um, something particularly tricky. And I don't know, Alexander, maybe in your international work you have um, examples of this as well. But you know, then you have you have potentially different types of funding streams. You have different aid development um, coming in into place, and then you have, you know, the values and priorities in place, right? And I think um, to try to understand something like landslides, which are terribly complex, they have to do with you know land management practices, who lives uphill, who lives downhill, um, the way in which you know storm patterns interact with this landscape. It's just there's so many things to consider. I think that. Hopefully, um, you know, one of the ways in which we're sort of going in our world is to recognize some of those differentials, power differentials, and who has voices, and who, um, how, how can we help to raise the voices um, of people who aren't always heard, who might be, you know, perpetually on the receiving end of things like um, terrible mudslides, and sort of try to um, have a more, um, it's tricky to say rigorous com compassion, but a rigorous compassion, you know, that is scientifically um, informed, is 
uh, something that could fly in the policy world, but is also understanding that some people don't have voice and how do we, do, how do we incorporate those people? Okay, thanks. Here's another student question. Make sure I give him the mic. In Europe, what is the, I guess this is for you, Alexander. In Europe, what is the role of gray water in water policy? And for other panelists, what should it be in the United States? Maybe you could define gray water. That depends a bit on the one that, that asked the question. Where, where does the gray water question come from? Um, it's not here. It's coming in from. It could somewhere. be coming in from. Oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry. I thought uh, <laughs> someone wanted to ask so a question. Back. No. So all the water that is not uh, cleanly coming from out of your tap that you can still reuse after um, after you've used it for the first time, um, there is um, there's an increasing need. Uh, to do that. So there's increasing government policies that require you that once you have used water for, let's say, your production or once you have used it in agriculture to reuse it again. There's mostly water facilities in Europe, and certainly in the Netherlands, they are in government hands, but they're kind of semi-privatized. It's, 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 it's often a kind of mixed form. Traditionally, it used to be something purely government, but now it's more privatized. And uh, we try as much as possible uh, to reuse the water. So that, let's say something like fracking, the water you use for fracking is just gone. You can never ever retrieve that, use that again. It's horribly polluted. And uh, uh, fracking often takes place in dry regions where already a lot of the water is gone. Um, so that is the kind of policies where you should be extremely critical whether you would really need it. Um, in uh, a lot of other instances, uh, a lot of industries are um, really trying to build their industry in such a way that you can reuse the water. Who are very good at these nowadays are, for instance, the beverage industries, the, the beer brewers, the Coca-Colas and Pepsi-Colas in the world. They are really trying their best to um, to make maximum use of the water that they use in the in the in the processes that you can reuse uh, that again. Um, so if there's a big difference between Europe and the US, I cannot really say. I think for the individual industries, you see very positive examples on on both sides. Uh, yeah, for instance, initiative like uh, CEO Water Mandate at the um, uh, Pacific Institute in um, uh, in the Northwest. Portland or Seattle, Portland, I think, um, where CEOs of top companies um, support uh, a, a number of commitments, and that in includes being as wise as possible on your water, so on, on, uh, on reusing it, not using too much in, in, uh, uh, in, in taking care of the environment. So there's a lot of positive initiatives there on, on both sides. Um, I expect that uh, EU regulation might be stronger in Europe uh, than, uh, than in the US. I expect that in Europe you might see more um, uh, a stronger role of governments also in, in, the, in the ownership of, uh, of water. Um, and it might well be possible, but I've, I never made that comparison really, but it might very well be possible that the valuing of water is also something where we're making progress. Because if something get scarce, it's like on the stock market, you know, when you have something that is becoming more scarce, it becomes more valuable. And actually, if you make it more valuable, then people will also be more careful how they are using the water. And that's the same as, it's, 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 it's the flip side of what was mentioned earlier, I think by you, by, um, by putting a price on polluting the, the, the environment. Let the polluter pay, uh, that's also with water, let the user pay. Um, why not let everybody in this room pay a bit more for your water and then you'll be more careful with how you use your water if you just start in your own household and then do something good with the extra money you earn you know it's not for the pockets of the person that owns your water it's it's communal uh, money so those are just a few ideas on this okay anybody else well two things first of all Again, I'll recommend another book called The Big Thirst, which I don't know if any of you have read, but there's a wonderful example of water reuse in that uh, book. In the Australian wool industry, 
they have to wash the wool like nine times because it's so dirty when, it get, when it's shorn off the sheep. And what they discovered, and this was a private company that figured this out, that was a big wool washing company, is that they only needed the cleanest water for the last washing. So they were able to use for the first eight washings a water that was still dirty, but it got it to the final wash, and so they, they completely and dramatically reduced their use of, of good water. Um, the other thing, just a little, another fun fact, um, the technology actually exists to recycle wastewater. It, it is not being done in the United States, as far as I'm aware of, because uh, Americans can't stomach it. <laughs> but it may be a, a form of water recycle in the future, because the technology does exist. Thank you. We've got one more uh, question from a student, and then they'll say get more, we'll move on. Uh, student question, does the United Nations have the ability to create and enforce a water rights agreement and water policy in which member states would be guaranteed a fair share of available water? Uh, this somewhat relates to your example of the Nile. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the question is, does the UN have the ability yeah. to make that happen? Uh, short answer is uh, no, not in a way that the UN is is like an, 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 uh, a higher authority that can tell countries what to do. But also, yes, uh, there is the UN Water Treaty, and, uh, which has a very long name. Uh, but the UN Water Treaty was negotiated a long time ago. It took 25 years or something to negotiate the UN Water Treaty. And then finally, when, when the agreement was there, it took another 25 years or so to actually have enough ratifications. I've got a number of assumptions, like 20 or 30 ratifications. It was only two or three years ago that finally enough countries had ratified it. And basically, although it's a very uh, long treaty, um, it, it doesn't specify in detail between countries what should happen, but it, it, it's, uh, it recognizes the fact that if, um, several countries make use of the same water source, which is often a river, but it can also be an aquifer under the ground or a lake, for instance, that you all have uh, the right to a, a fair share. The fact that the, the negotiations took so long already proves how reluctant this is. There's normally the difference between the upstream and, and downstream countries. So there were three countries in the world that actually voted against the treaty. It was not that they just you know, they didn't, didn't uh, support it. But they were voted against, all three of them were uh, upstream countries. Yeah, it sounds like, you know, the water that falls down our country is, is fully ours. And then when it crosses the border, it's completely up to us as the owners of this water, uh, whether we release too much or too little or whether we pollute it. Um, luckily, a lot of other countries were, were a bit more flexible, but it, it shows how difficult it is. One of those three countries is China. I mean, a very, very important country. There's 20% of the people in the world live in China. They got only 7% of the water. Um, there are sources of water that go across, across the border to, to, to India and also in Southeast Asia, they're dependent on water of China. Um, it, it's, it's very interesting to see how in the future when the tensions about less water are getting higher, um, how the coordination between those countries uh, will improve on water. There's a lot of initiatives there. Um, then the last remark, there's a second water treaty in the world, which um, is from the UNECE, that's kind of, let's say, the European section of the UN, to put it simply. They already had a treaty much longer that was actually working very well, and they had regularly meetings, etc. I think that the UN treaty doesn't have. And in the same year that finally, after some 50 years, this UN treaty ent entered into force, that, UN, that UNECE treaty was made open for the whole world to join. So we have two treaties. They're both, so in one year time, we went from zero treaties to two treaties. They're both worldwide applicable. Anybody can, can join them. And they are, luckily, they're saying a lot of the same things, but some things are very different. For instance, if you have uh, difference of opinion between two countries, how you resolve your problems. 
uh, there, there's, uh, there's, there's different methodologies. So, um, as a diplomat, I'm, I'm happy to say that there'll be enough work for diplomats on this for, uh, for many years to come. So, if there are students here that look for a job in the future, well, this is uh, uh, diplomats will be needed. Thank you, Alexander. Uh, we have another student question, and uh, please remember if your question doesn't get asked, I'll make sure the, if you address it to a speaker that they see it after the session. Okay, um, this is from a student. How do we address the public fear of having water controlled by mega corporations, <coughs> thus losing control of quality, access, and price? Okay, well, that's obviously for me. <laughs> Um, we have some uh, very important principles at American Water. One of them is that uh, particularly when we make an acquisition of one of these water companies, water facilities, we work with the local facility and we provide generally uh, a guarantee that the water rates will not go up any more than inflation. I will not say that other companies do that, but that is a, uh, that's a policy for us and we generally meet that policy. Um, I guess the only other answer I can give to the question is, yes, I guess we're a greedy corporation, but we uh, plow back something like uh, 50, let me think about it, more than 50% of our earnings go back into investment in the company, and the other 50% goes out in dividends. Um, we finance in the capital markets. The company, I'll brag about them, we've grown, um, Dramatically, we've grown from a $5 billion market cap to a $17 billion market cap over the last eight years. And uh, we're obviously doing something right. Uh, and we, we take customer surveys all the time. We, we compensate our senior executives based on the results of those customer surveys. And if we find anything we're concerned about, we, the board, we get management to dig into it. We also, um, I, I will also brag about the fact that we are the only S&P 500 company that has a female CEO and a female CFO, and 50% of our board is women. Um, that's changed, well, it's, it's actually was 62%. It's going back closer to 50 because we needed a little more diversity on the board. <laughs> so um, we're very, very sensitive about this. Our CEO is just one of the most amazing people I've ever worked with. And uh, safety was frankly an issue when she came in and we've spent, she has just, just you know, beaten this topic into everybody's head and we've improved the safety ratings of, of our, our employees and of, of our customers and anybody who's in the general vicinity of our company uh, or our facilities. We've improved it dramatically over her four year tenure um, so I, th I would like to think we're a very responsible corporation, and I think we've gotten good ratings on that, that front from, from various organizations. Uh, but it is. I mean, I understand that's what people are worried about. As I say, people are very proprietary about their water. They don't seem to care about their wastewater, but they aren't proprietary about their water, and that's fair. But there are ways that you can, you know, you can vote with your feet in terms of investment. And our stock price since 2010 has gone from 2150 to as high as 93. It's at 82 right now because of interest rates and utilities are not in favor. But um, we've returned a good return, to uh, an excellent return to our shareholders and to our communities. So. Thank you, Martha. And one last question for Heather. Um, Heather, this question has to do with the um, priorities that Alexander mentioned on uh, flood mitigation and, and risks. How will po water policy development go forward to incorporate voices of indigenous vulnerable communities to the flood mitigation risks that were discussed? Um, hopefully it will go forward. I think um, actually, you know, taking off um, from Martha's point, I think that um, constituents and stakeholders and clients have a lot of voice, right? And so, um, the more that we're aware of our neighbors and who those might be, the more that we're aware of situations on reservations and what that situation might be, um, regardless of whether it's a you know, tribal community in the US or indigenous populations elsewhere, I think that um, you know, having that sort of social conscious in, what we, in the decisions that we make, right? Whether the, the companies that we support, the companies that we um, pay our money to, I think that you know, we're, we're learning so much in the last several years, um, especially with 
certain inertias at the national level, um, we're learning so much about the potential and the capacity of local communities, right, and grassroots communities. And really, in the reservation context, that's most of what they've always only had for several hundred years, right? And so they're certainly used to that. But the prerogative is for the rest of us, too, to, I think, consider those, um, those sort of moral, con social contract parts of being in a um, society with different types of people who have different types of voices or are heard differently at different levels. Um, so I think that, you know, obviously being active, doing what we believe in, but doing what we believe in even when we think we're buying, you know, a dollar fifty bottle of water. Um, and that goes for, you know, not just um, water policy, disaster mitigation, but also for the environment, obviously. And so, you know, what I was trying to talk about before is that for some folks and, and you know, we can all learn from this, there isn't that dichotomy between society and nature, right? It, it totally breaks down. Um, and it really breaks down, you know, we can all see it in our, in our lives and in our communities and our environments, but it especially breaks down when you have a different worldview about how nature and um, human communities interact. Okay, thank you. Um, it's time to wrap up. I wanna thank the panelists. Um, I think they... In a short period of time, they very well communicated to us and supported the view of a global water crisis, but also presented some solutions uh, in the realm of water policy uh, and regulation that might uh, be a starting place to solve some of these issues. We, I don't believe, have to be out of this room for 15 more minutes. Uh, the speakers may have other engagements they need to go to. As I said, I'll pass them along. Uh, the questions you gave me, and if you all want to stick around for a few minutes, uh, feel free to do so. But thanks for attending today. Enjoy the week. Yeah, there's a, um, yeah, the procession. Thank you. Let me see thank what you. the timing is. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh.